I'm going to attempt to not mess up your whole stand, Trent, but I'm stealing it. <laughs> Anyone ever wonder if this will hold a Bible? <laughs> so I want to start in different places I was going to. I get asked every year, why do I go on store? Why do I sleep on a gym floor or a library floor like this here and go for what used to be 10 days is now seven? A guy my age doesn't recover, or doesn't recover quite as fast, which is very true. I want you guys to know you should be very proud because you send us on SOAR every year. I get to say that Erin totally ran ICYA, Inner City Youth Live. She was entirely in charge of our program this year, and it rocked. Graham led our entire team this year. I just kind of sat back and let him do it, and Devin ran all of our team times. I'm not sure why I was there some days, minus putting on a few Band-Aids. But it's because you guys believe in us and send every year that these three are an example of all the leaders that have rise to this occasion and that have uh, continued to rock this out. But that is not my message for today. I just came to that suddenly. So our heartland is complete for another year. If you can't tell by some of the tired faces and all of that, we're still tired and we had a great time. The 350-plus people have gone home for the most part. Some of us belong here. <laughs> Our team and volunteers are mostly recovered, even though there's some sick and some tired. The stage is back to normal. If you saw it before, it was kind of intriguing. And we're slowly finding things that don't belong here, and we're finding things that aren't in their home and trying to find them again. So it's come to a close. For those that were here on Palm Sunday or watched it online, you will see it was a very different sort of service. There was a great energy and a fair amount of chaos happening in the room. I especially was proud of the moment with Eric as they adapted to moving to the boardroom for a choir practice. No idea how they fit in there, but that's the only room we could find free that morning. So thanks for adapting. It's a little bit of work to host something like SOAR. Our theme on SOAR this year was feast. Many times through the Bible, it talks about how we get together and enjoy these lavish meals uh, with friends, family, and strangers. And we still do this today. We just passed the Easter season. I imagine many of you were like my family. We got together at my daughter's house, and we fully enjoyed a meal of roast beef with all the fixing, even a cake and some jello molds made by my granddaughter. It was a great time. And that's the place we find ourselves in today's passage. In Luke 14, we're going to go through most of the chapter, much of it today. So if you're interested, again, it was page 1046 if you want to do the lazy way. If not, start in Matthew and work your way through until you make it to Luke. And join with me. We're going to start in Luke 1, or sorry, Luke 14, 1 to 6, where it says, On the Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being watched carefully. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling in his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts of the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Oops, helps if I stay on the right page. So this meal was planned by an affluent uh, Pharisee. As was the custom then, people would attend that wanted to uh, up their ranks within the system. And here's Jesus' first example, this man who had swelling issues. We don't know from the account whether he was an invited guest or he's just someone that snuck in to hang out with Jesus. But either way, he was clearly in discomfort, and Jesus noticed that. Before appetizers are even served, it seems Jesus is teaching and testing the people around him, which was very much his normal. So he asked him a very loaded question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath for this suffering man? To me, this is the way Jesus always seemed to be testing people. He'd ask them a very loaded question, and then he'd set them up. I believe the question is really, is it better to follow the law or show compassion on suffering people? But this is where I'm concluding today, so we'll carry on. 
Jesus heals this man, then reminds the people that practically, if any of us were in a situation where one of our children or someone that affected us was in trouble, we'd help them. Then he turns to the fellow guests in verses 7 to 11. I told you we're staying here for a while. If you care to read along. Then he turns to the guests and says, When he noted how the guests picked their place of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may get invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Knowing the right people has always been a way of getting forward in our careers and our lives. It was done then, and it's still done now. Uh, The expression is, it's not who you know. Well, it is who you know, really. So we'll emulate that one. But this was the example. People were claiming seats close to the host that invited them, because clearly he was probably the most important person in the room. It gave them a chance to talk to and possibly pitch ideas to this person and end up with something of a higher social rank than they entered with, maybe. Or at least a chance to get the voice to the movers and shakers. The challenge is you had to pick the right spot. If you're important enough, you can move close to these movers and shakers and you'd be fine. But if you pick the wrong seat, you might be asked to move. But if you chose a spot too far down and you're with the common folk, you might not gain anything. In fact, others will be looking at you for advice and uh, different business practices they might enter into. So what happened was Jesus, what he said wouldn't have been that popular. So much of what this is about taking a chance. It would be on the host noticing you and moving you up rather than being assertive and taking charge of the situation. And I think in our culture, taking charge of a situation is way more common than hoping someone notices us. He ends this example in verse 11 with, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves would be exalted. I think this is very much the truth in our Christian walk. Uh, When we live with ego and pride, God has a habit of gently reminding of us what our place is. I can think of this summer when uh, I had that incident. I remember thinking to myself before summer, what a crazy summer I have. So much is dependent on me here at Westwood. Uh, That was quickly followed by a motorcycle accident and me being gone for a few months. And it's amazing how people like Aaron, Tyler, Kim, uh, Graham, so many others stepped up in a way that I couldn't possibly have done. Sometimes I think we get in God's way if we think the world revolves around us. Now, clearly, God taught me To make ministry happen here, he chooses me. It's not reliant on me. Now, before you hear me say that God caused my accident to put me in my place, I don't believe that even slightly. But I do think that if we use those times when we're inconvenienced to connect with God more, he might just have some things to say to us, especially if we take the time to listen. God has a way of using life and our choices to get our attention, if we're willing. Jesus then moves his attention onto the host of this feast, the one that invited him. In verses 12 to 14, it says, Then Jesus said to the host, When you have a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or your sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and you will be repaid. But when they give you a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. He reminds this man that he should not just be inviting his friends and family and everyone else around him. They're going to invite him back to a party, and it's kind of a mute point. You're just hanging out together. Having parties is about inviting those you like the most and celebrating your success together, and that's not a bad thing. But his point is they can and will repay him. But if you help the poor and the underprivileged, those who are unable to help you, you're actually truly blessing someone. You're 
reward is for helping and caring for those people that cannot care for themselves. God notices when we help people that can't help themselves. In fact, he commands it all through scripture. So as much as it's nice to hang around like-minded people, I think we're called to a higher place. Through all these stories, three times Jesus kind of says the same message. It's about how the kingdom of God is about caring for the poor and underprivileged in society and not seeing what we can get out of it. Now, it's not about getting ahead and navigating to be more affluent or successful. Nor is it about getting everything wrong or being successful. It's about doing things that come as a cost to us. This may lead to acknowledgement here on earth, all these wonderful things with each other, but it doesn't carry over into God's world in the way he sees things. Often, the friends of this world can also be pretty fickle. They may love you in one moment, but a few minutes later, they're gone because you can't do anything for them anymore. This lesson is way more about our attitude and how we interact with people than about trying to get ahead. This leads us to the rest of the conversation at the feast. The piece Devin read at the beginning, starting in verse 15, tells a story about a parable. It begins with a man who says, Blessed is the one who will eat in the feast of the kingdom of God. It's important to remember here that all of these people around the table would have been the faith leaders in the community. So they knew exactly what the feast in the kingdom of God meant. At some point, they're all going to be with God, and they'll have eternity with him. Uh, in doing a lot of reading, this statement this man makes is one of two things. One, he's making a statement of, we get it and we're in and we don't have to worry about this, which in that case, Jesus is questioning if they really got it. The second thing is, he might have been trying to distract and put a stop to this conversation because Jesus was calling them out for their attitudes, not their actions. Either way, Jesus continues with his last lesson of the feast. Remember, this is all one meal, by the way. So he's pretty much poked jabs at everyone there. Jesus reinforces the point where the affluent are often busy and distracted and where the kingdom of God is not our biggest priority. I find myself seeking my own little kingdom all the time. And I find myself thinking about a legacy. What am I going to leave behind? What things are going to happen? And I neglect to see how God's working around me and in me all the time. And I forget to welcome him into the space. Instead of accepting the invitation of the feast with God, I made up excuses of how I'm too busy to do things for him. One of my favorite uh, things Russ ever said to me was, he told me that one time Jesus wants and requires one thing from me and one thing only, and that's a relationship. Disciple pe discipling people, reaching people for him, speaking and teaching, those are all great things, and those are important. But if it doesn't come out of a place of the relationship we have with him and the uh, expression of love towards him, it's all kind of pointless. We're just doing the right things. So sometimes I find myself being too busy for God. If you ever find yourself in that place, it's probably time to rethink things. When Jesus invites us to the feast, he is really asking us to dine with him to be with him, to be in relationship and fully satisfied with him. Look at the family gatherings you remember the most over your life. What do you remember? Is it the food, the activities? For me, it's never that. It's the people, it's the relationships, it's the things and people I hung out with. The time with my family is memorable. And a cake made by my granddaughter is more valuable than the best meal in a restaurant in that moment because it's about the relationship. Jesus does invite us into a place of feasting with him, where hungry and, hunger and thirst are finally truly satisfied. But the tension still exists for us here, or at least I can speak for myself. The Holy Spirit often convicts me of my attitude. The Pharisees knew the law better than anyone, the people at this feast, and knew exactly what the rules were to follow. But they lacked understanding of what the heart of God behind some of those rules were. They wanted to do the right thing, not necessarily with the right attitude. For me, I still struggle with the same thing. I know what God wants, and I find myself in a place of teaching the right things to the right people. 
The challenge is not the Bible and what it means. I think that's fully true. It's often how we live out the love and compassion within that that uh, causes problems. My favorite example of this comes from Jesus himself. And now we're jumping out of Luke. In John 1.11 we read, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early in the morning the next day he was back in the temple. A crowd had gathered and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman is caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you have to say? They were seeking to trap him, yet again, into something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up once again and said, All right, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down and continued to write in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only was Jeff, Jesus was left standing in the middle of the crowd with the woman. When Jesus stood again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Does not even one condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. In this story, people like the ones at the feast bring this woman before Jesus, intending to trap him. Again, they know the rules and they know the law. And Jesus would have known the same things. In fact, they're probably very curious how Jesus would respond. And the tension hung there between the word of the law and the relationship of the hurting woman. And I'm getting to a point of this eventually. Uh, He does, sorry, Jesus has every right, more than anyone there, to accuse her and punish her. But he chooses grace and love. He chooses to have compassion. Yes, he does expect and demand change from her, but it comes out of a love for her, not fear. So why am I choosing to end here today, you might be asking yourself. On Sorry, we work with a group at ICYA, Inner City Youth Alive. In fact, my heart breaks, uh, and still will for a long time, for a brother and sister I got to work with there. We learned that rules are very important in the environment and structure. But it's our unconditional love for them that changed everything for the people there. They're so used to conditional love, and if we're honest, so are we. We have a chance to let them see Jesus through us. So where rules are important, compassion is still needed. And so it is with us. The law of scripture is really important. Don't ever hear me say otherwise. But grace and love, which we need to live it out with, is equally important. And I find this is the tension I always live in. To understand the law and live it out, as the gospel of Christ takes the Holy Spirit teaching us and living in our lives continually. After all, he died for everyone. Our responsibility is simply to accept his invitation to the feast and represent Jesus well enough to welcome others into the feast also. As we get to hear more stories from Graham as we continue, I'm grateful that we had this experience with SOAR and ICYA because this is how we really learn who we are. I think so much more of it's about us than sometimes the kids were reaching. Thanks.